Okay, in part one of the video, all I really showed was the lovely components of the game, which are of very high quality, and I explained why I didn't like the comprehensive example of play, since it really was showing one human player and three bots, and I explained how I'm not really interested in playing against bots. Now, lest people be aghast, I do not damage the original booklets. I always work from copies, so this way I can highlight and emphasize things that I have trouble with or want to find quicker than the index can show. So, what you're seeing uh, are copies of the rules, not the original rules. Now, in this video, I'm not going to possibly try to explain to you how the game plays. That would need a much longer video. Actually, it would need several videos. I think the best way to learn the game via videos is to uh, do several uh, videos. Perhaps one just on the political phase alone, perhaps another one on the theater phase, and uh, maybe on the military. So this is just gonna be a very general overview of the game. Now there's one little snag in the uh, setting up the game which People may have missed, I don't know, I certainly missed it, and it is missing in the setup. In the setup, I expect to do everything to set up the game and be done with it. But we've got this, there's something missing. It says here we shuffle the three decks, the Aristophanes, the Athens, political and Spartan. We've done all that. We've shuffled the Athens deck, and we shuffle the Spartan deck, and we shuffle the Aristophanes deck just like the instructions state. And then it more or less says you go to the abbreviated sequence of play, which begins with the Aristophanes phase. But already we have a problem because something's missing in the setup. And it's actually in the playbook. And I'll show you what I mean. Now the remedy is here. Like I said, it's in the playbook. Where it says the special scenario rules indicate that each Spartan faction begins this scenario with their faction leader, as always, plus a specified card, da da da. So, before you shuffle the deck, you're going to have to take out the faction leader cards. There's uh, four of them. Two Spartan and uh, two Athenian. So those have got to be separated first, and that's missing in the setup. I certainly missed it. And... Uh, why it's in the comprehensive example of play and not in the rules, I don't know why. An omission, I guess. But it's a critical one, and you need to know that. But even that's rather incomplete, because he does say here, each Spartan faction doesn't even talk about the Athenian. That's because the Athenian uh, faction in this example of play will be run by the bots. But they still have to have those cards separated, I would think. I don't know. But I'm going to leave the bot structure because, like I said, I'm not into bots. I don't care about bots. So uh, watch out for that when you're first learning the game. You'll have to set aside the uh, faction leader cards, of which there are four. Now for optimum play, the game should be played by four human players. It was designed that way. But Mark has made the, uh, the bot system so that you can play one player, two players, three or four. So if you're playing, I'll assume, four human players, one player will take the Europonded party, another will take the Agiad party, and they're all, all part of the Spartan um, Peloponnesian League. Now it'll be upside down, but I'll move the camera. Two other players would take the Aristocrats on the left, and the other party would be the demagogues. So it's four individuals trying to win the game. Of course, you're trying to get your side to win the war, Sparta versus Athens, Peloponnesian League against the Delian League. But personal victory is done by acquiring the most honor. And that's done by getting your individual honor chit for your party up that track. Most scenarios, the honor begins at 10, and you try to get your honor going up that track. And it's quite a long track. This track goes up to 99. Now, I haven't played it long enough.
to know how far you generally get up there. So if this is like a little racehorse track. Immediately you know who's kind of winning individually by watching these markers move on the track or down, by the way. So honor for the individual player is the most important thing for winning the game. So it's quite possible, therefore, to have you win the game individually. Let's say I'm playing the Euro Ponted player and I get the highest honor. I personally have won the, the game and yet I could be on the losing side. Athens could defeat Sparta. So that's dual victory conditions and I think they're kind of clever. Uh, that's why I, I, it must be a lot of fun to play this in a four player game. Now let's take a look at the political side of the game. Now this is not going to be a detailed examination of how to play the game. I'm just going to highlight certain things you're going to be doing. I just want to explain overall what you're trying to achieve. Well, in the political part of the game, your party is trying to win more issues against the enemy party. And you alternate back and forth between the Eurpontid and the Agiad party by placing issues on your track or in the middle. For example, let's say the Eurpontid player wanted to debate a military issue. And there's various rules whether they go on the one or two track. I'm giving you a very simplified um, illustration of what goes on. And let's say the Agiad player also chose a military. That's an issue that would be debated. Then we go back to the Eurpontid, and he might pick um, a league issue, which you might put on the one space. There's also instances where you put three issues in the middle on the zero space. And the Agiad player does the same. He might want to debate another military issue, maybe consult the oracles, or a war and peace issue. Now that's a simplified version of how the debating starts in the game. You may have noticed these little remarkers here, and the Europonded player has this little marker on his side, while the Agiad player does not. This means that he's the dominant party, and we mark it also here to show he's dominating the assembly. Therefore, he would go first. Again, I'm simplifying things down, but in this case, I've got nine cards here and nine cards for the other party. Yes, I didn't explain about the brain trust where you can set aside three cards. There's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts even to this. But for the purposes of the video and simplification, let's say the uh, your ponded player wanted to debate a league issue. So what he would do is he'd look at look at his cards. It isn't drawn randomly. He'd look at a card at his cards. And since it's a league issue, he would want to pick a card where yeah, there's a good card. And he doesn't show it to the other player yet. And the other guy knows that he's debating a league issue. He would look at his cards. And he might want to win that, so he looks for a league issue, and he has one too. All right, so he would play this. And both cards would be shown. And you would take the two on this card, add it to three, five, and three plus one, four. So this side, your ponded, has won the issue. And then when that is the case, the issue that he was debating on goes up one notch. So that's generally how you uh, do the debating. Yes, there's strategos that are also taken from the pile here, but I won't get into that. Again, that's generally how the debates work. Meanwhile, on the other side of the board, the Athenian two players are doing the same thing. This can be done simultaneously or alternate. It doesn't really matter. But once the debating is finished, then you're going to take those issues, all the ones you've won, and convert them to these little markers here, which is the same thing, rumor, league, diplomatic, except you see they're a different color, and they also are specific to your side. The EK counters are the Europonted, the AK counters are the Agiad. All right, 
For the sake of argument, let's say that the Europonted player won three issues and the Agiad player won two issues. Yes, this is simplified. It's more complicated than that. But generally, that's what you do. Then in the theater phase, the Europonted player, the Agiad player. Meanwhile, you've got two guys over there too, the aristocrats and the demagogues would take their issues converted to these bluish markers and one by one they would be placed on various theaters on the board. Now this is not a setup, I've just randomly put uh, units down there. So let's say the Europonded player is going first and he would place one issue face down on the theater of the war that he wants to influence, face down. So this player and those players don't know what that issue is, you know. And then the second player, whoever that person will be, and that will change, he would put a marker down, put his issue. He might put it in the same theater. He might put it in a different theater. We'll say he puts one there. Then the third player would put an issue down. He could put it on the same theater or a different theater. Let's say in this case he puts it on top. And back to the Athenian player, he puts another issue. Let's say he challenges this and puts it on top. And Mark has a rule, and it makes sense. The first chit in is the last chit that goes out. Because when you go to resolve these issues, you always have to resolve the top issue first. So there's a very little sub-game right in here about who goes first and how these issues affect the game. So all the debating over here on the left certainly is going to affect what goes on in the theater. Now, once you get to the theater phase, all kinds of stuff can happen. For example, let's say you won the league issue. There's four options there. So one of the options is construct a base. Another option is convert a base. Another option is build military units. Or, option four, remove any treachery markers, which I didn't really explain. But that's how you create military forces on the board with the various issues that you've won. And that's just a league issue. Um, Oracle issue. What if you won that? You gained three honor. Well, that's kind of nice. Remember those markers I told you about over on the side, the honor markers? Well, if you played that, your honor marker is here, up she'd go three. So some of them issues just give direct results on the honor table. The military issue, of course, is much more complex. It's so complex, it has its own little section after because so many different things can happen in the military issue, depending on whether the area is friendly, uh, enemy, neutral, empty, and then that's going to take a couple of pages to explain. But overall, if enemy forces are in the area and you can move forces in, that's the beauty of the game too, you can have um, combat. Now I guess I should explain about the colors of the units. Red units are Spartan. Yellow units are Spartan allies, all part of the Peloponnesian League. Blue are Athens, and white are part of the Delian League. So, again, Athens against Sparta, but with their allies, the Delian League, the white counters, and yellow for the Spartan. Now, it's, it's the interaction of all these rules, the politics, the military, that make this such a delightful game and a good simulation of the war. Now, I haven't even got into the Strategos, which you're going to want to acquire to help you in combat, create bases. There's a mine of information in this game. As you saw in part one of the video, the player aids for the game are absolutely superb. You've got individual charts for what happens, land theater, what the values are, naval theater, what they are, the combat losses for the loser, for the winner, naval combat losses for the loser and winner. The playing aids are just superb. 
and uh, you've got more aids here too. League issues, military issues, the Oracle, ostracism, I haven't got into that. I couldn't possibly get into all the sub-menus of the game. It, it's just a dynamite game. You've got this terrific setup chart for playing any scenarios. I might point out that there are a lot of scenarios in the game. Let me count them. Okay, I count uh, 23 scenarios in this game. So there's no way that this game is going to get stale, that's for sure. And uh, that's not even counting the solitaire scenarios. Again, those are mainly against the bots. I should point out that a lot of the activities you're going to do have to be hidden from your uh, opposing faction. And you get these uh, cute little uh, screens. There are four of them in the game. And in it, they show an abbreviated sequence of play and what each of the issues are. And the other side is just generic. That's all the enemy sees. And uh, again, the Athenians get their sequence of play. So GMT has done very well with this edition of the game. I have to mention the map because it was done by Newt Grunitz, uh, who does beautiful jobs on maps. He's done uh, the map from War for America, and he's got a lot of credits, and I love the way he does his maps. I love this period map kind of in the background, and the theaters are very well delineated. By the way, the blue boxes for the theaters indicate primarily a naval theater, and the brown boxes primarily is a um, land theater. Um, movement factors are all explained here, how you move the men. The granaries are important but with these granary symbols. Uh, I've just touched the surface of this game. It really deserves uh, multi-videos. That's what I uh, think someone should do, is do, a, I'm not the person to do it because I, I don't know the game uh, that well. I have yet to play it with uh, human players. I'm just still studying it with the bots, playing solitaire, learning the charts, and there's a lot here. It's uh, The learning curve on this one is um, quite daunting. I mentioned in the first video that uh, I would mention the only regret I have about purchasing the game, and it's not really a negative. In fact, it's rather a positive. The only regret that I have with this game is that I probably won't get to play it very much. And Enrico and, and uh, Callendale said as much in their videos. Because the game is so in-depth, the learning curve is quite steep, you're going to need at least one player that knows this game very well to teach it to three other players. And I have a hard time getting four people together to play such a complex game. And, um, you know, you're going to dedicate a lot of time to it. And as Mark himself has said, you're not going to unlock the treasures of this game by playing it once. You're going to have to play it several times, dedicate a lot of time to it, to really appreciate how great this game is. And it is a great game. I'm inclined to put it in the masterpiece uh, category. I... Uh, categorize very few games as masterpieces. One of them is Republic of Rome by Avalon Hill. I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, the second one is Empire of the Sun, done by Mark Herman himself. I think it's a masterpiece of the Pacific War. And the third one is the U.S. Civil War by Mark McLaughlin. I think it's a masterpiece. And I would like to give this game masterpiece status also, but I'm loath to do so without having played it with four players. I don't know how the experience will be with four players. I suspect it's going to be a lot of fun. I don't know. Some of the cursory reviews I've seen say that they like the game, there's a lot to it, they're glad they purchased it, but some of them hint that they didn't find it that much fun to play. I wouldn't know, I just haven't played it. I have no regrets about purchasing this game. 
and uh, here it is in what years after it first came out. So I did not buy it in 2017. I've only owned the game now, what, two weeks or so. Been studying it just about every day, moving the counters around, and uh, I've got a vested interest in learning this game. I'm very interested in the Peloponnesian War. And so far, um, it does not conflict with anything I've read. Um, for those of you who haven't read anything about it, you can't go wrong by reading uh, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. It's still a terrific account. It certainly is interesting to read the mindset of a man who lived over 2,000 years ago. This is a fine classic, and uh, you might enjoy reading it. But the game reinforces everything I've read in Thucydides, and that's a good thing. So in closing, I'd like to say one last thing about the game. And for those of you who are having trouble learning it or are kind of turned off about how complicated it is or don't think you can handle it, um, I'm reminded of a famous quote by Arthur C. Clarke, and I'll quote it in a second. Um, when Arthur C. Clarke's book came out, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Stanley Kubrick's movie, uh, a lot of people were um, couldn't figure out the ending. And uh, the movie was criticized for that. And Clark got all kinds of um, letters and comments asking, uh, you know, hey, explain the ending. And Clark was, you know, trying to sell the book at that time. And Arthur C. Clark's quote, I find, is applicable to learning Pericles. Clark's quote was, read the book, see the film, and repeat the dose as often as necessary, unquote. And that's really true for Pericles. It's daunting to learn. Um, rules of play are, are pretty good. I said, watch out for that snag about the setup and stuff. The playbook is fine, except for my old pet peeve about bots. I wish Mark had designed it with uh, four players uh, in the illustrations. That's, I have nothing negative to say about the game itself. It's uh, a beautifully produced game. So that's it for Pericles. Maybe I'll get a chance to play this someday at a convention. I know a bunch of us are meeting next week or so to try Republic of Rome. Maybe I can uh, get some of the guys to try Pericles. Anyway, um, that's it for part two of Pericles, and uh, thank you for watching.